morning, Robin. Welcome to the Entheogenica podcast. I'm really excited for this for this journey that we're about to go on this morning. How are you and where in the world are you? I am calling you from South Africa and really looking forward to this because we always end up having such interesting conversations. So I'm quite curious to see what's going to come out of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, for everybody that's watching, I was you know, welcoming Robin in this morning and just letting her know we're going to really go on a very organic journey. And I like to allow a kind of a level of spontaneity and curiosity to guide these conversations and these spaces. And I think that's also quite reflective of this sort of feminine water energy that just wants to find the crevices and um, merge its way through through the rock. So that's a, a deep seed of our our intention. So I want to begin with, um, yeah, sort of in that vein, teasing through my own curiosity, which really is around our shared love of mysticism and I guess witchcraft in many ways. And this is the kind of question I want to pose to you today is, you know, your own journey into working with, um, with the feminine path and the path of the mother, which we'll really delve into in a little bit more detail. How would you reflect upon the kind of journey that brought you here, that brought you to this path? And was there a calling from a young age? Were, were there kind of peak moments that you experienced? Was there a spiritual emergence or spiritual crisis or any of these kind of pivotal moments across, across your, your life that have, that have led to now? Yeah, I mean, probably the, the biggest calling and right from the onset for as long as I can remember is my connection to the earth and this deep infatuation um, and love of the mystery that is Mother Nature. So for as long as I can remember, there's been this draw to um, earth-based practices um, to the divinity that exists in nature. And there's been a strong compulsion to explore uh, mystery across the spectrum, um, from Buddhism to a strict mystery school that I was in. Um, I have a deep love of Kabbalah. But um, the glue that's always held it together and always brought me back um, to my path when I've got lost, um, purposely lost, um, in these explorations has been my love of the earth. And I would say for me, that's become the greatest parameter of truth in everything I learn. Because when I get lost along a path, I will eventually reach a point where I will look back and assess how worship of the earth, how worship of the mother, um, and how the practices along that path are potentially guiding me to become a better or worse earth citizen. Um, and so it really has been nature that's, that's held it all together. Mm, mm, this is beautiful. With, with this, you know, you've mentioned Kabbalah and um, kind of having studied Buddhism at some point. If you were, if there's a woman listening today and she's like, I would like to take my love for nature. I would love to take my love for nature and deepen it into some form of kind of esoteric understanding or maybe the maybe bridging the the experience of nature with a with a system or a logic or a or a direct direction. What would be the advice that you would you would offer to a woman that came with that? Well, I mean the the way that, that she speaks to us is through our heart. And I really do believe that the heart is a place of um, feminine wisdom. Um, that any, any path we walk that is um, a path of the goddess, a path of the feminine, um, a, a path of wholeness, will always be centered around that inner voice and the calling from the heart. And so the first thing is to slow down and to create the space to listen. To our hearts. Nature doesn't speak to us um, in rationality. She doesn't speak to us in structure or logic. She speaks to us um, 
in the silence of our hearts, and she speaks to us through cycles, through rhythms. And to really tap into these cycles, to tap into these rhythms, to tap into the abundance, abundant codex that exists in her sphere requires that we slow down and we start to trust that inner voice. And my personal experience has been the deeper I walk along this path, in many senses, the more murky everything gets, um, the less I feel I know the less sure I am of anything. And my understanding is that um, everything around the feminine is around birthing potential. And that place that we birth potential is, of course, the void. It's that place of pure and infinite potential that has no structure. It has um, no form, no logic, no story. It's a place of pure potential. And so the more that we work with her and the more that we naturally fall into her cycles and her rhythms, the more accustomed um, we are guided to become to finding comfort in what is essentially quite an uncomfortable place for the mind. And again, that takes me back to this becoming um, and holding a reverence for those cycles, for the rhythms, for that level of communication that is beyond mind and exists in the heart. What are the thresholds for you personally in how you meet her? You know, how do you, in an, in an average day or an average week, where, where are there rituals? Are there practices? Are there ways that you come to this sort of state of listening, explore exploration of the, the creative potential? Are there you know, steps that you take to sort of expand your way of interacting with her? For sure. So, I mean, I can probably answer that in a few ways. In terms of thresholds, the greatest threshold is comfort. And um, I would say that the foe is our personality. It's that part of us that we started adopting that's false um, from the moment we took our first breath when we came here. It's that part of us that are the desires and the expectations of everything and everyone around us. And so the idea of going to the threshold and going to the edge, um, we go with that intention to start to relinquish our hold on our personality and to start to cultivate more soul. And so any threshold that's gonna take us to that place um, is one that's worthy. My experience has shown me that there is no greater setting to dissolve personality and to really get in touch to with our truth, with that um, true part of ourselves and the wild. Because um, the personality, that part of us that um, attaches itself to the stories to the logic and to the structure abhors the wild. Um, you know, there's a very good reason why as the um, planet has become so consumed by a patriarchal story that we've become so afraid of the wild. And so for me personally, that threshold is taking myself to the wild and it is also um, weaving in elements of the unknown. And um, the, the two coexist. So for instance, the first time I went and I sat in a cave for three days in winter, um, there was this threshold of the wild. I'm, I'm in a wild place. Um, in Africa, we have predators that could quite literally um, eat me. But there was also the unknown of the cold. Like, is it safe? A am I like mad doing this? Is this a sane thing to do? Will I be able to keep myself warm enough? And um, and then there was also this immense um, threshold of the boredom, of the sitting in silence, of not being able to distract myself where the true work started to happen. Um, the same thing when I took myself into the forest um, and spent three nights in the forest. And again, I was told that the forest is a killing field. No one in this community has done that. It's not safe. So there was this threshold again of um, my heart is directing me there. My mind is telling me it's not safe. Um, can I cross that threshold of another layer of personality, another layer of other people's stories and other people's beliefs to go and find that which is true within myself? 
Mm, yeah, this is very, very beautifully put. And I know that in in my own work, this this threshold with the, with the wild and the simplicity of sitting out has been, it is and remains my greatest teacher in terms of the meeting of the self and and the and the remembering of the self as nature. And the the part around fear is quite interesting. And obviously, you have. Um, vigils in quite dynamic spaces that do have you know Africa is different to Ireland for example in terms of poisonous snakes and um, leopards and and whatnot but even in that there's there's a there's a mirror emerging for me which reflects my very first night vigil I remember going to the the indigenous forest on the, the, the River Blackwater and my husband sat at the gate at the entrance to the forest and I went in and I sat in the dark and I can remember the sensation of all of my fear around all of those constructs of the fear of the dark, the fear of isolated spaces, uh, was there going to be a man in there? Because what we do have sometimes is people kind of go in there to to drink alcohol or, you know, into these kind of remote places. It happens in Ireland. So I remember having to sit with my body and actually witness the the rising of the fear, the 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 jumping at every movement. And I found that to be such an incredible exercise because what nature was allowing in many ways was, first of all, there was this direct speech, which was, you are nature, you are safe here. And I think this is a lot about becoming more embodied, becoming more um, uh, in communion with the space. And in that moment, I got to watch how much fear we're walking around with as women on an, on, an, on an everyday from the stories that were told by society and by the, the, the safety that we have been exposed to throughout our lifetimes. So I love this part of you taking the, first of all, taking the initiative and then entering into these spaces and coming out rewilded, I suppose, in many ways, that's the, that's the foundation. So with this part of Kathy, entering into Kathy. nature, yeah? Yeah, so I interrupted you because I just wanted to um, to add something to that that I felt valuable. So um, there was actually a practice that, that you guided me on um, in one of those vigils where you, you made this comment around the tremendous somatic work that would happen when we were facing fear and that when I was sitting in fear in the dark, to really go into my womb. And there was this practice in that cave. Um, I couldn't even make a fire because the wind was blowing. Um, the farmer had said to me, whatever you do, don't put the fire out because of the leopard. The fire was out, I was sitting in the dark in this cave and I was, I was terrified. And um, I remembered your advice of go into your womb. And so I lay on the earth with my womb touching the earth. And, and every time there was, um, like a wave of fear that came on over me, I would like face it head on and push it into my womb. Um, and the, the tremendous value of, of the somatic work of not distracting ourselves from our fear. Um, it was also so critical to the process. And I think is such an, a valuable piece of advice to pass on to any woman, any person listening to this. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to say before we, we moved on, because I've actually um, meant to say it with both your previous questions in terms of across all the traditions I worked on, what drew me here, and again, you know, what are my practices that keep me anchored in this? Um, and there is something to be said around honoring the cycles. Um, you know, as a woman, we know, like, we are just one walking cycle. Depending where we are um, in relation to our bleed influences so much in terms of um, the way that we operate into the world. Um, and there is great beauty and value in learning the cycles uh, of nature around us. And the witch's calendar is obviously a beautiful place to start in terms of the cross-quarter days, the equinoxes, the solstices. The moon is an incredible guide for um, these cycles. 
And so to answer your question too about the practices, to anyone listening that's embarking upon this path, your best guide is going to be the natural rhythms, um, the natural cycles, and just starting to honor those, starting to make ceremonies with that. And there is incredible codex all in itself that doesn't need to come from a guru or a teacher beyond oneself. Um, the guru or the teacher is the cycles themselves. Yeah, I love it. And I love that we are actually recording this today. It's the 1st of February, so it's in bulk here in the north. And is it Lunasa in the south? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. that. Yeah. So here we are. Um, the day of the harvest. Yeah, the day of the harvest, meeting on this day, meeting on this this threshold to to journey through the exploration of the cycles. What does the word magic mean to you? Wow. Well, a, a textbook will, would have told me a hundred times over that, that magic is the ability to create something out of nothing or the ability to change one thing into another. Magic has become to mean so much more to me, though, because it's, it's the essence of divinity to me. Magic is the light. And so when I reference magic or I think about magic, it's not just the craft, it's the observation of the light in nature that for me would also come under this umbrella of magic. Which I suppose is true because that light that we're observing in nature is nature constantly making something out of nothing or changing something into something else. Beautiful, this reflection, the reflection from the natural world and the natural order. With with all of this, with this part around, you know, coming to the cycles, observing the language of nature, sitting out, becoming more attuned to the magic that, that is reflected to us through this creation of life and through the cycles of decay and rebirth and um, the essence of, of, of the frequency of light and creation. What do you feel is the the role of women, like the role of women throughout the ages and the role of women now in re sort of restoring this language, restoring these practices? What emerges for you? What is emerging for you in your own work and the women that you're working with around this? So if we look at the original um, tarot deck, if we look at um, those original illustrations and we look at the lover's card, you will notice that um, there is a male and a female on the card and the male is looking at the female and the female looks direct at the sun, which is behind a cloud. The male in the lover's card can't see the sun behind the cloud, only the female can. And there's a, a beautiful mystery, there's a beautiful truth that comes from this particular card in the tarot deck, um, which I hold deeply true, which is that it is the feminine in all of us, and as women we naturally embody this more, that is the line, the direct line to the divinity. And it is the masculine in all of us that looks to the feminine to receive that divinity. And even if you look at the interchange, you know, and, and I'm doing the infinity symbol of, of, of how these two primal energies operate in our universe, what is happening is that um, the masculine, as we all know, is around manifestation, bringing something to form. And the feminine is the energy that gives form. And when we are truly holding the feminine in maturity, when we can allow the energy that is being fertilized and incubated, that direct line to divinity, to, to be ripe, to really, to really be beautiful and fertile and ripe and um, have the patience to allow that process, the masculine, the inner masculine can take from that energy and create such beautiful form. And I believe that what's happening on our planet if we break this down very simplistically, and obviously this isn't always the case, and we say, okay, women primarily embody the feminine and men primarily embody the masculine, 
and we look at how women have been dominated and subjugated and ignored, like quite frankly, ignored on the planet for so long, and you look at the state of the planet, you can see that there's been like a half-baked, half-fertilized energy that's coming into the form. And the form that is being created, the form that is being manifested, is um, it's not sustainable. It's, it's, it's very much, much based on a very selfish, short-term vision. Um, and that's because the energy that it's drawing in um, isn't fully formed. And to take this back to the role of the feminine, I, I really believe with all my heart that the role of the feminine, therefore the role of the woman, um, is the channel. It's the ability to hold potential, to bring in potential, to bring in light. And it is the role of the inner masculine or the role of the masculine, if we want to simplify it, to then take that energy and to create beautiful form with that. And so even like simplifying it, 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 it even further, I so often say to my husband, my role in the house is to bring God or the goddess into the home. That is my role. It's my role is to be able to see so far into the horizon that I can bring in that potential into the home for you and for our children and for me to therefore do something with it. And if I'm not allowing myself the space to do that, if my family are not allowing me the space to do that, what we are going to be manifesting as a family, as a tribe, as a collective is half-baked. And so I believe that the role of the woman is the shaman. The role of the woman is the priestess. It's the witch. It's to, it's to create the space to listen, to create the space for the light, to create the space for the void, so that what is being brought into our world is so much more mature, so much more whole, and so much more full with light. Mm, I love this. I really love this. Within this journey, within this journey that we are all on, and, you know, there's a couple of words there, maturity being one, one word, the spaciousness that we require in order to really be in that space of being the conduit. And then this expression of the feminine as the priestess, as the as the, the sort of shamaness and these ancient traditions that were originally feminine paths. Within the, the world that we find ourselves in, this sort of, you know, social media and um, a lot of... Mm, potential but also a potential for distortion what do you feel is necessary for this maturation to occur to sort of take the reverence of what it means to be a priestess the reverence of what it means to be a shaman and not create kind of a glamorized expression of that what emerges for you when i when i kind of bring that energy into this this space between us well i'm smiling because the word that emerges for me is is probably atypical expectedly atypical and that word is the darkness for a seed to bloom for anything to reach its full potential before it comes out into the light it needs to incubate in, in the darkness. But there is so much light. There is so much growth that those aspects of us that we can't see of ourselves that are in the darkness, in the unseen, the rejected parts of ourselves that need to be brought into the light. And so I'm talking here, obviously, about shadow work. And I'm talking about soul work. And this takes us back to the importance of the rewilding, of the vigiling, of crossing the thresholds, of really coming to understand how much we carry within our identity that is not actually ours and stripping ourselves bare of that identity. And that is how men and women come to maturity because I am very much of the point, and I believe that this is the more mature um, evolution of the feminine, that 
The goal is not for the feminine to rise over and above the masculine. The feminine is no more precious than the masculine. The masculine is equally pre precious. What the planet is calling for now is unity. It's calling for that deep cosmic marriage to be manifested on the planet. And that is requiring all of us to go into the dark and to do the work. And that requires that we start to assess why we are so afraid of pain. Why are we so afraid of pain? Why are we so afraid of comfort? And um, why are we in such deep glamour? Why are we so intoxicated by this idea of perfection? I really believe that this weave that keeps us in a place of immaturity has so much to do around um, the false light that is perfectionism. And I believe that actually that is what is feeding a lot of the like new age fluff, which you and I both know um, is, is, is not something that either of us actually have too much time for. Um, and I feel that it's such a cul-de-sac, this idea that um, we need to keep everything perfect and we need to keep our vibration high and things look a certain way. Yes, of course, nothing simple. And there is, there is truth in that, but there is also a lot of truth that has been misunderstood and manipulated by this infatuation with perfectionism. Whether it um, is the foundation of why we are so obsessed with celebrities that look a certain way versus the change makers in our society. Like, where does that come from? Versus um, the incredible resource, the planet's resources that we rape and we pillage from her for us to look a certain way, for the planet to look a certain way, for our homes to look a certain way. It all stems from this false light, light um, narrative around perfectionism. And truthfully, we incarnated into the planet for evolution. We didn't incarnate here for perfectionism. And it's this idea of perfectionism that I believe keeps us trapped in an immature space. And if I had to take that back to the origin of your question, and we had to now put focus on the feminine, and we could as equally do it to the masculine, but we'll focus on the feminine for now. There is this perhaps necessary stage of evolution that one may go through as the feminine starts to rise, where the feminine looks so beautiful and is so seductive, but we have to really be careful of the false light narrative in that, of the immaturity in that, because actually it's the hag, it's the crone that holds the power. That's who we're aspiring to to that woman who will, walks so empowered that she doesn't need someone else to tell her what aging looks like, what beauty looks like. And, and that is the real part of beauty. And so there's, there's just so much to unpack around this perfectionism. But when we as women are not holding ourselves accountable for our own shadow, shadow when the feminine uprising looks like blame for the masculine, when we start blaming the patriarchal domination that's happened on the planet on men, not realizing that those men that burned the witches are not necessarily the men that are standing in front of us today, not recognizing that the patriarchy um, lives in all of us, no matter what gender we hold, not recognizing the deep victim in the feminine that allowed this to happen in the first place. These are all narratives that the mature feminine starts to do in her shadow work as she abandons this idea of perfectionism, as she starts to see the choke on freedom, the, the desperate unhappiness and suffering that this idea of perfectionism creates in all of us. Yeah, this is beautiful. It's beautiful. And the you know, we we've spoken about this and we've we've sat in this idea of the the beauty way and this is something that both of us follow and the beauty way is the path of nature and it is the path of cycles and it is the path of change and evolution and change of form and change of shape and the the radical i think the what comes up what's emerging for me listening to you talk is there is a hunger there for more truth, right? There's a hunger there for more women to be able to come forward with that which is uncomfortable or come forward with 
and find the beauty in this, right? Find the beauty in the, the full spectrum of the human experience. And I think globally right now, we're really watching this piece around, you know, sacred activism versus keeping the vibe high to maintain a peace of mind and 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 it, the system in and of itself is starting to kind of break open into this part of the this request which I feel personally which is this request of how deeply can you feel how deeply can you witness how deeply can you hold space and as as women that means that it can look like anything really and how can we be willing to 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 evolve with with this opportunity that's emerging for you personally when when we talk about discomfort right we're we're talking here about women showing up in communion with the masculine in communion communion with 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 all gender with all expression of human life and really witnessing and I I spoke to a client of mine a few days ago and I said I want to hear more women talking about how tough this is it's not easy you know there are days that are hard there are days where we are exhausted it's not all beauty and glam and um, success and sales and all of these things that that are be, we're being kind of conditioned into to sort of see what the successful feminine looks like. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about this, about this idea of the descent and how that is part of your own cycle. So um, I've written a book that I'm trying to get published all around this and it's so interesting for me because when I wrote the book which is very much around the descent into void what that looks like how to navigate it and how difficult it is to actually drop in to that descent to to really have a successful dark night of the soul if our inner feminine isn't activated this is what the book is around the importance of the feminine for that work when I first wrote that book I went into at that stage in my life what I thought was a deep transgression into the dark night of the soul, a, a deep falling into the void. And I wrote the book. And now two and a half years later, I sat down two days ago and I read the, the book for the first time in a while. And I wept. I, I, I wept because I thought that I had gone through that. And I now, I now look at where I am and the dissolution and the unraveling that has happened in my psyche and my being, and I realize that I'm still in such deep process of unravel, that I'm still being initiated by the book that I wrote. Um, and so I speak very passionately and authentically and humbly about this experience because I am so constantly humbled by how difficult it is because when we start the process of awakening, the first thing that happens is that as we heal, we let go of the things that we want to let go of, and that feels good. And so we imagine that the rest of the process is going to be like that. And then another cycle of dissolution comes, and we have to let go of some things we don't really want to let go of, but we were aware that they were there. So it doesn't feel so good, but still we're quite proud of ourselves. We feel like these amazing warriors of light, we are healing. And then we get to that process where we really start to go into the blind spots. We start to now, or spirit, the goddess, starts to work on those parts of our identity that we didn't even know, we were completely conscious, are not actually our authentic selves. They are not truthfully who we are. And I believe that I'm in that process of myself now, where I am letting go of stuff that I didn't even know needed to be let. I don't even know what's going. That's how deep the unravel is. And I have so many women that I counsel and I work with that start walking along this feminine path and they start to feel lost. Um, and as you know, it's something that I've, I struggle with. Let's, let's call it, I struggle with and challenged by daily how murky the crooked path can be, this middle path can be. And the deeper I walk along it, 
the less I know, the less I feel I know about myself, the less I feel I know about where I was going. Where 10 years ago, when I was 15 years into my like awakening rather than the 25 years that I, I am now, I the more I was doing the work and the more I was doing the healing, the more I knew about myself. Now, the more I'm doing the work and the more I'm doing the healing, the less I know about myself. And this is actually where the true work is starting because there are such deep layers of my identity that are being unraveled that even my mind, my identity can't keep up anymore. And, and this is also, I believe, what starts to happen is our channel, our ability to hold and channel light into the collective starts to mature as well because the less defined we are about who we are, the less agenda we have and the less we try and structure that channel, the less we try and structure the work, um, the, the more we can actually humbly be of service to the goddess or, or of the light, however you, you want to speak to it. And so, um, you know, going back to the, 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 the way I see myself being reflected in my clients all the time is that they come to me and they're like, but the thing is, Robin, can you help us find more clarity? Um, can you help me know what my purpose is? And 10 years ago, I would have said, yes, I can help you. Let's sit down and do this. Because the, the more masculine part of me, um, I was a successful businesswoman in a previous life, in this life, um, would say, I can do this. And now with a little bit more humility, I sit in front of these women and I go, I can't teach you how to do that. Because actually, it's just going to get worse. You're going to be more confused about your purpose. You're going to be more lost about who you are. What I can do is to help you with the practices to get comfortable with that. Because the deeper we walk along this path of the feminine, the more we come to a point of awakening, the less surety we're actually going to have about anything. The, the work is not to become sure. The work is to become so soft that we can be uncomfortable in the not knowing. And that's what's so hard. On top of that, there is something else that must be said to your question, which is that I don't believe we live in a love and light reality. And I do believe that there is a lot of evil on the planet. And I am, I feel that it's time to start calling this out. And it's time to start talking about this as the great unravel happens. And I, I know from my own healing um, of which I'm still very much a neophyte in the own path that I walk, that the moment we are hiding anything, evil comes in, into ourselves, into our lives, into our relationships, into our narrative, into our voice, into our channel. The moment we are hiding anything. So part of this awakening, part of this maturing, is getting to a place where we are prepared to look all the time. We are prepared to stare the deep trauma of the planet in the face. We are prepared to hold that pain. We don't hide from it anymore. And that is excruciating and it's meant to be. You know, I, um, with everything that's happening on the planet, myself and so many of my sisters are feeling this low-grade depression. And you know what? It's okay. How can we not feel depressed? But it's pain that has purpose. And so I think that it's there is nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing to hide in saying to our sisters, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I'm sad, um, I'm getting involved in the fight for freedom on the planet, but it's making me feel depressed, it's making me feel tired. The point is not to stop doing that, the point is to work deeper, to, to utilize the tools that we have, to find the light that is there. there. There is always light, there is always hope. But the moment we start hiding anything, this is how this pervasive, not truth, the not light grows on the planet. And so just to go back to that original question, that in itself is hard work. Yeah. 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 The the phrase that's coming to me um, is something that I've I, I ordered a book, I haven't read it yet, but it's been coming up these past couple of weeks is around this um, Native American phrase of the Wetico, which is this kind of um, parasitic energy that feeds through that that creates sort of greed and war and uh the word cannibalism actually i was reading about this this morning this idea of this kind of can cannibalization this like extractivism of resources energy all of these parts 
and that part when you're speaking now something just locked in for me which is that sort of parasitic astral consciousness of the wetico for just to use that word it is this is where it latches in it's the minute that we step out of radical truth we create a sort of a vibrational invitation for for this this energy this consciousness to to operate through us and so there therein as well you've answered a question for me which is why do some of us have such a visceral physical reaction when we watch um or engage with certain people's work who maybe are new age voices guides mentors whatever it is why we have this sort of visceral response to this does not feel like it is in true integrity or this does not feel like this is true true a, a true conduit and it's a it's it's not a logic it's a it's a physical reaction and that responsiveness ties into this piece of if we cannot show up in the truth of our flaw in the truth of our sorrow in the truth of our joy like all of these parts and it doesn't mean we have to put all of ourselves on display for the world because it's not it's not about that we obviously need privacy but how can we show up in the moment when no one is looking like really be with what is alive and what is what is occurring in the moment and something that i spoke to my teacher about last week which feels in resonance here the more that i mature into my practice the more i mature into my craft the less invasive i am because i'm starting to notice how even specific healing practices that i maybe worked with 5 10 years ago ways of healing or bringing trying to create a change in the person that's sitting before me by inserting myself in some way by inserting this healing tool i learned or this shamanic tool i learned that by by inserting myself in that moment i'm actually impeding on that individual's sovereignty and i'm impeding on the very raw process of allowing them to be with whatever is emerging and i've watched my own evolution become slower and slower and slower to just simply want to keep company to each other and i think there's something beautiful in this of we can have guides we can have teachers it's i think it's important for me personally i think lineage is important i think eldership is really important i think companionship is really important but it's about finding those people that will allow us to emerge rather than dictate a direction or try to make a change within us does this resonate with you absolutely and it it feels so beautifully feminine with what you're talking about and something came up for me in your earlier comment um in this last bit around when we talk about how if there is um a holding of truth in anything we allow this parasitic energy to manifest and that in itself speaks so clearly to how horrific and enslaving this idea of perfectionism is because when we hold on to something being perfect that's when we hide because nothing is perfect if if we look at the great tapestry of nature nothing is perfect and every single root every single seed every single branch is unique and nature holds nature doesn't manipulate and so if we use that as a framework in terms of of how we hold space for another it speaks so beautifully to this mature space of holding that you are are speaking to mm mm-hmm. questions on the goddess so obviously both of us for everybody um watching listening both robin and i would be in patronage to to a goddess consciousness and for me personally that patronage is more to do with having a teacher just like i have my human teachers i have this teacher in the aspect of a specific archetypical expression of the goddess 
that resonates for my soul in, in what I'm here to learn and what I'm here to remember about who I am. And um, it's not a kind of a state of um, hierarchical worship. It's more a state of uh, studentship, tuition, apprenticeship in many ways. And I, I'm just curious about your, you know, what has learning from a goddess or creating room to listen to an archetypical expression of the goddess, what do you feel that's brought to your life? So I agree with everything you, you've shared about the, you know, the, the reason to, to work in this way and to um, have this kind of patronage and to follow this lineage. And the, the word that really comes to the fore for me is service. I believe that these archetypes that the various goddesses hold, these faces that they hold, they make up this beautiful whole on this planet and they are holding certain templates. And part of the remembering and the coming to and the learning from these, these goddesses and their archetypes is about bringing us into more of our soul potential. But it was, there is also service to the planet in anchoring that archetype, that face, that template, and holding that corner of whatever it is. Um, so I work with the goddess Diana, who is also um, known, and you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap with Artemis. And... I can't say that I have the full picture every day. I learn more around what the energy of Diana is, what, what her work is, but I am watching myself become more and more clear on the beauty that lies in our wild and indigenous ways on the planet. And that speaks so clearly, for instance, to a lot of the, the energy that Diana holds for the planet, which is, you know, she is the goddess of the wild things, the wild places, the wild people. And that, that speaks to um, our uniqueness. It speaks to indigenous culture, indigenous ways, allowing the ancient and unique ways on the planet to be held, to be safely guarded. Um, and obviously also to allow those aspects of self to come to the fore to allow the, the wilder, the undomesticated, the untamed, the true authentic parts of ourselves to exist. And so for me, there is a lot around that kind of teaching in the service. And then I just, it's just who my makeup is. I adore the devotion as well. I believe that devotion is just such a beautiful part of the practice that keeps us so humble um, and hold, helps us to hold that dictomony of, we are everything, but we and we are we are so important, but we are also so small and so insignificant. And yet we are so significant, but we are also so insignificant. And the devotion to the goddess and all that she holds is such a beautiful practice of devotion to the mystery. And so I really value that part of my practice because of the devotional aspect that it brings in. Mm. Oh, I love it. So beautiful. What would be your recommendation to any woman that's curious about embarking on a goddess path? So I advise a lot of my clients who are at the stage um, to actually start reading about the archetypes. And I, I advise them to do this in a very spontaneous and organic way. So to bring in the practice of listening and observing rather than using the mind. So you know, watching how their body feels when they come across certain books, when they hear certain names and, and doing their research in that way. So kind of starting with quite a, a blue sky, let me um, play with the archetypes and then see where my body starts to, to lead me. And I have, I mean, the absolutely no doubt that what will materialize is quite a crystallized path of which goddess archetype any female um, can work with. And, and sometimes some of us are not strictly just working with one. And even if we are patroning ourselves to one goddess, obviously we are constantly being influenced and working with all the other faces of the goddess, which you know so well. So um, I think that within each goddess archetype, there is ma uh, magic for all of us. There is learning for all of us. And so the more goddesses we can learn about, the more that we can immerse ourselves in the history of the goddess 
the more that we can open ourselves to the various ways that she may want to work through us. Beautiful, beautiful. You mentioned here this piece of through this devotion and through this remembrance that we are anchoring and sort of seeding this template back into the planet, which is also, I think, an important part of the if you look at the evolu evolutionary cycles of the planet, you notice how different ages had different expressions of the archetypical form. And, you know, it is it is our consciousness, it is our imagination that seeds this expression of divinity into the collective. So I think that's a really beautiful way to express it. So what that leads me to is a kind of a question which is simply, if I say the word ascension, what emerges for you in terms of, do you believe we are going through an ascension? Um, have you some thoughts on that? I'm, I'm curious to see what emerges for you with that, with this piece. So the, the word that comes up for me with ascension is presence deep, deep presencing to everything. It's it's around that sacred relationship, the inner authority, the, the deep presencing, which brings us to a place of sovereignty. And I absolutely believe that a timeline is opening up on our planet for ascension. Um, this is something that I have spoken to in the book that I've written, which is that we are going through a position of the equinox, which speaks to... Um, the, you know, for the past 13,000 years, the earth has been moving away from the light and has been in a, in a period of the masculine. And we are now moving back towards the light and we are also moving back towards the feminine. But that is also at the same time weaved in with this idea that we are moving into the age of the Aquarius. And when you look at how the the goddess has presented herself during the different and the gods have presented themselves during the different ages, you can see very clearly the influence of the energies of the various planets at those times and how our sky influences what's happening on the planet. And Aquarius, the Aquarian energy is all around balance and unity. And so I really believe that the goddess is rising at this time as we move to, as a planet moves into a greater level of photonic light, but the goddess is not rising to dominate the masculine. The pendulums that we've done that, the pendulum swam out to a, a, a very matriarchal centered society, to a very patriarchal centered society. And where we are moving to is to now find balance. And again, as I was saying, start seeding that cosmic marriage. But with, with every opportunity, it is a timeline that is opening and there is always choice. And so I also don't necessarily believe that it's a given. Um, and I believe to come back to the initial part of your question, what does ascension look like? For me, ascension also looks like unity. And so there is a very potentially narcissistic and self-absorbed level of spirituality that I believe that we are starting to heal now as we come back to a place of linking our arms with other people and understanding that spirituality is very much around our brothers and our sisters. And spirituality is not around this elitist idea that it's okay if only some of us ascend. We might all be working on different levels, and there might be those of us that can hold higher levels of the ascension template. But I really believe that this particular timeline that's coming is a timeline that speaks to one and all. We all ascend, or none of us ascend. Yeah. I'm I'm really grateful to hear you say this because this was a transmission that I received in 2018 and I was in a deep medicine space and I received this very clear, I don't know, inspiration or communication. It felt like a communication and the communication was this. It was like ascension is occurring, but it's not guaranteed and it is a it needs to be a global ascension, not just the few, which is contrary to a lot of the narrative in the New Age community, which kind of speaks about, uh, you know, separation. And we're we're seeing that we are being 
offered moments of separation we saw through COVID. We're seeing it right now with the political situation on the planet where there's this consistent invitation to separate, to polarize. And much of our work is to, can we drop further in and find that point of connection, harmony and acceptance with each other? Is that possible when we are sitting in the face of really deep challenge? Okay, so we seem to have lost Robin from the connection, but that was a beautiful space to, to finish with this part of, you know, really considering these words, considering ascension, considering community, considering, yeah, how can we drop into deeper states of presence? And I'm definitely going to have Robin back on for another podcast so we can go a bit deeper into some wisdom from Diana and the goddess path and the path of the witch. But for now, thank you so much, Robin, for a beautiful recording. I will pop your details on underneath this if anybody wants to get in touch with Robin for some exploration. Then I highly, highly recommend her work. Thank you. Thank you.